Professor Hyunjun Park. Uh, thank you very much for having me this opportunity to share my work uh, here at the University of Michigan. You guys, this is actually a lucky day for you. Not because, I mean, you came to my talk, but more actually because it is actually you know, the Chuseok, which is actually you know, the full moon festival in Korea. So this is one of the actually probably two most popular festivals in South Korea. So that's why you have actually Songpyeon, which is over there. So if you haven't tried, please try. I mean, this is very, you know, typical tradition to eat Songpyeon in this, you know, the day. And also, you know, over the Songpyeon, you can hear about, you know, what the Korean education is all about. So today's talk is about Korean education. Because it is actually in you know, a topic that probably, you know, just some of you are very familiar with Korean education. Like either you went to school there, or you just simply know lots of things about Korean education. You know, it's not like in a you know, very historic topic, like a 15th century in South Korea, you know, in some area. But it is a story of, you know, the very contemporary story, especially among young population in South Korea. So I'm sure that you have very, you know, kind of your own idea about the Korean education, and you have your own strong, you know, opinion about Korean education. So I'm very looking forward to get some feedback from you as well as, you know, I like to kind of persuade you to see, you know, the Korean education in different angle. And in recent years, actually, there's a growing public and academic interest in Korean education in the United States. Actually, just right after starting his job as a president, actually, the President Obama, you know, the, made a speech on Korean education reform into this Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in March 2009. In his speech, he actually mentioned Korea, South Korea, very particularly in, tw in twice, actually twice. These are some, actually just two places where he actually mentioned South Korea. So I will just read a couple of you know, the sentences here which seems very interesting. So our children, listen to this. Our children spend over a month less in school than children in South Korea every year. That's no way to prepare them for the 21st century in you know, the economy. So here's actually, you know, the President Obama compared, you know, U.S. education to South Korean education in terms of this length of schooling. So Korean kids actually, you know, to go to school longer than actually U.S. kids every single year, which probably you know, after a few years accumulate, you see that there is a you know, growing difference in terms of number of schooling exposed to, you know, the students, right? And just right be, you know, behind this remark, actually President you know, Obama continued to talk that, now I know longer school days and school years are not widely popular idea in the US, right? I mean, everyone doesn't like to have longer school days, even kids, even me, I mean, it's everyone. Does <laughs> not like to so they said if they can do that in South Korea, in other words, if they have longer years of schooling in South Korea, why can't we in the United States? So he said, we can do it right here in the United States of America. So this is a, probably the first mention about Korean education by President Obama in a, a very early of his you know, career as a president. Why the President Obama was so interested about Korean education? Because there's just some record about that. Korean kids at the you know, fourth grade, there's number one ranking in science every scores among 26 team survey. Like there's in you know, sociology and in education, there's actually various you know, kind of international survey of students' achievement. A lot, lar large number of countries actually participate in this business to see how their kids are you know, doing well as compared to the other country. So among 26 countries who participate in team survey, actually Korean fourth graders actually scored number one in a high score, average scores in 1995. It was not only one time, but also, you know, eighth graders, not only the fourth grade, but even eighth graders ranked number two in men's average, you know, the average score. Another indicator of success of education in South Korea is from the program for international students assessment that was conducted in 2000. Here's we have little older kids, like a 15-year-old kid. Even their Korean kids yeah. scored, you know, the high scores on, in science. What about the math? Yes, number third, actually number three among the 41 PISA country. This, you know, the remarkable record actually, you know, the, the make actually people, especially in the United States, 
to become interested in South Korean education. Okay. But right just after you know, the, this remark by President Obama, Korean newspaper actually you know, they was very happy to see this remark on South Korean education. So just right after the day, after they you know, keep talking about you know, how President Obama plays in you know, South Korean education. But they also, at the si same time, Korean newspaper consider this remark by President Obama is very surprising. Here's a you know, quote from the Korean News Time, Korea Time. Say Obama <coughs> remarks came as a surprise to many South Koreans as the country education system has been under constant public criticism due to its lack of creativity. Please pay attention to this, you know, the criticism say the lack of creativity among and heavy independent uh, heavy dependence of private tutoring. This is very typical criticism on Korean education. First, you know, lack of creativity <coughs> among Korean kids. Korean kids may do well in academic tasks, but they are just not, you know, they just lack, you know, the uh, creativity. And also this, you know, the heavily dependence on private tutoring. So this was kind of response from the Korean newspaper, you know, to the <coughs> President Obama remark on South Korean education as a kind of example of success. But not only Korean news media, but also <coughs> US, in the U.S., some of the news media were very critical about uh, President Obama's remarks, especially Gerald Bracey, who is very actually, you know, very critical about this business of international comparison of students' achievements. He said, "See, you know, President Obama raves." about South Korean school. Again, South Korean school, right? But they would like to say that thousands of South Korean families sell their children. Yes, sell. This is a very strong notion, by the way, right? I mean, we don't sell our kids to American families. <laughs> but this is a hunting, you know, the thing to post. I mean, you know, this is, uh, so their kids can A, learn English, and B, avoid the horrible rigid of Korean school. Again, very typical criticism, right? Very, and I very you know the you know the rigid school system in Korea. Then beyond this criticism on Korean education, actually Gerald actually even tried to say good things about U.S. education. They say while the U.S. trail Korea on the average test score, yes, you know that you know on average you know the average score is lower in U.S. and you know Korea and other actually Asian country, but. U.S. has a higher proportion of students scoring at the highest level on program for international student assessment. So this is one of very typical, again, you know, kind of, you know, the praise of U.S. education that, yes, we have low level in every score because we have some students who are struggling with achievement, but we also have, you know, very, very high level of, you know, the students who are very doing well in compared to perspective. That's a very typical, you know, U.S. kind of, you know, perspective on their its own education. But I'm saying this is totally wrong. I mean, there's, I mean, I will show that actually evidence that this remark of is wrong. I mean, it's not true that U.S. kids actually, you know, they show the highest percentage of, you know, the scoring at the highest level. So I will show that evidence. But again, this kind of, you know, the debate on this President Obama's remark on South Korean education clearly indicate there's some, you know, misconception in my sense, and also some kind of, you know, still underlying kind of, you know. Uh, very traditional, you know, sense, you know, the understanding of Korean education. But despite this criticism, still, you know, President Obama continued to talk good things about Korean education. So he <coughs> visited Korea, I guess, November 2009, and he met the you know, President Lee. Then he asked about, you know, what is the major factors that you're concerned about Korean education. Then President Lee responded to him saying that Demanding parents are the problem of South Korean education. How can we say that? I mean, having parents who are interested about students' education, is that a problem or is that actually good things that we want to actually you know, have more? So actually, you know, the Obama, in a sense, was shocked by, by this respondent. That, you know, the, indeed the parental involvement is just kind of lacking in the U.S. education, but in some countries like Korea, it is a problem rather than it is actually, you know, the good things for children's education. So even if somebody is dirt poor, they're insisting that their kids are getting the best education. Obama recalled the conversation you know, uh, with the, uh, the Prince Lee and Lee, whose biggest education problem is that their parents wanting more education, actually for excellent school for their children. So again, uh, 
whatever you know, the, whether you know Korean news media and U.S. media, you know, criticize the Korean education. But President Obama was, so, you know, still was concerned, uh, interest about you know Korean education, as you can see from here. Then what about the you know the way in which was in the Korean education was featured in the uh, news media, major news media in the U.S. So in 2009, very typical, you know, the way of featuring Korean education. It's all about basically cram school in Korea. If you type Korean education in New York Times, very likely you see this kind of, you know, the story about the cram school, like, you know, taste of failure, fool and aptitude for success at South <coughs> Korean cram school. What a great picture. I mean, this is the city. I mean, the <coughs> sleeping, you know, in the, actually, you know, this is setting. And say, the you know, students at Jongno Yongji campus in New York, in South Korea in your morning curriculum. In 2008, not only this you know, one, you know, this article, but I actually just simply look at the New York Times and found so many things about cram school in Korea. It was just amazing how you, you, U.S. you know the media was so interested about cram school in Korea. I'm so proud of them in a sense that you know they're actually you know so much interest about Korean education, but only for actually basically for cram school. So let's just read some of the titles that you know that I think is interesting. So 2009 June 1st. They have, you know, the New York Times has an article about Korean students go online to cram for practical exam. Tech company helps South Korean students ace in entrance test. The story is telling us about the new media, actually new technology that actually even you can do cram school on online. <coughs> so is it one of the, you know, the advanced technology country, but even for the cram school. <laughs> you know, it's pretty similar kind of you know, the meaning, like at South Korean cram school, a singular focus. That's the title of the article of June 25th, 2008. And one of the, you know, the sentence here is that here, this, here in cram school, the students are denied every day teenage items in South Korea, like no cell phones, no fashion magazines, no TV, no internet, no game machines. The another article about Korean education is the prep schools consumed Korean students' lives in Ivy League press. Not only for the cram school for general students, but even the storytelling is about the cram school for design, especially for those who want to come to the U.S. I, you know, mostly Ivy League school. So this is a country where this cram school started to develop even for online, even for the U.S. school. So one of the probably you know the really you know the strong kind of you know the interest in. And, and the cram schools in South Korea. So this is a major, like, you know, the way of the Korean education was features in the major newspapers in the United States. Uh, of course, there's some other uh, story and articles on Korean education, but this is a pretty common, pretty, very typical, you know, the kind of, you know, the story about Korean education. So I have a three, you know, the typical criticism on Korean education that, you know, I want to talk about today. The first, highly standardized and uniform Korean education makes talent to students mediocre. So that's one big, you know, the kind of, you know, criticism on Korean education. Again, as you saw that in the great remark of that, yes, Korean education may have higher average score, but their top kids will not probably be doing well as, you know, the top kids in other countries, <coughs> right? So that's the first kind of criticism on Korean education. Standardized education system, uniform curriculum, that every student has to be exposed to make this, you know, the top talents or you know very talented kids do not, you know, d you know, move forward as compared to the other country where they are exposed to a different curriculum that actually, you know, they meet their needs, right? Like in the U.S. Um, uh, education, there's some mobility grouping within schools so that you know the kids who are doing at school may take you know advanced class, right? Even with the same school, but in some Korean school you can't do that because you are exposed to the same unique from actually curriculums. The second critical, you know, typical criticism on Korean education is very similar you know, with the, the first criticism. Korean education put too much emphasis on academic test score at the expense of creativity and independent thinking. For those who grew up in Korea, we don't have a creativity here. You know, so we all just based on the academic testing. So that's their criticism. By the way, I have I don't know but what the norm, but if you have you know some question, please feel free to ask me on the way. Like a group of students that are doing very well 
Well, I, uh, thank you very much. I mean, for, yes, I need yeah, that. Uh, right. Like yeah, the Cram School have a different kind of Cram School, but basically, Cram School is like a private institution where it looks very similar with the regular, you know, public schooling. Like they have a very similar setting, like you know, the teachers and the students sitting in the table, and they follow very much a school curriculum. Mm -hmm. But this is a private institution. In other words, oh, you have to, right. Yeah, you have to pay. It's not like you know the just public education. It's, so it's kind of shadowing to this you know public education. So they pay, you know, their parents pay. So the kids after school they come to the you know this institution, private institution. They take you know the, like a testing. They learn the, you know the how to take a test, and they review the curriculum again. So there's a different type of you know obviously you know the cram school. So maybe there's, there's some cram school that practically geared for these top students, but some you know the kids who like a, try to catch up rather than you know to move forward. Thank you so much. Yes, sure. Are, are those criticisms unique? To Korea education, or this is more general. Yeah, it's a very good point. Right, exactly Taiwan. right. <laughs> yeah, in, indeed, you know, this is actually you know the two. Uh, this is a chapter from my book that is, you know, the is coming out in hopefully in January. In that book, actually, I talked about Japanese Korean education together. So this is indeed not always the criticism on Korean education, but I would say more generally in Korean and Japanese and you know, also some, to some extent Taiwanese and Chinese education. But in that book, I have a chapter that <coughs> another misconception of Korean education is, especially in the United States, is that they don't distinguish between Japanese and Korean education system that well. Actually, Japanese Korean education system very interesting have a similarity at the you know, secondary, lower secondary level, but after that they have a very interesting difference. But Sometimes the scholars or public, you know, the makers who are interested in East Asian education generally, they don't make a clear distinction between Japanese and Korean education system, which is, you know, both for one chapter in my book. But in general, this criticism indeed actually applies to, many, you know, overall, you know, this Asian education. So we are all the same, okay? So you're not only Korean, but like if you're from China, from Japan, all we subject to this criticism. Third criticism. The high success of Korean students in the international academy achievement is primarily due to high prevalence of private supplementary education. In other words, they argue that no, no, public school in Korea probably is bad. It's not doing well. But the reason why they are doing international textbook because so Korean kids, so many Korean kids take a private lesson, private tutoring after education. So those are very typical, you know, the criticism, right? I mean, you already saw that in. In all the, you know, my presentation, I show some of the concern. Even is not from the U.S. perspective, but also within Korea, you know, people talking about the lack of creativity for their children's high, you know, dependence of private tutoring. So those are the three actually, you know, crit uh, typical criticism of Korean education. And my proposal, yes, so over there. Well, I'm just talking a little broadly when I say Korean education, but when I co say Korean education, it's probably more related to this, you know, like a public education system. So, but I mean, obviously the third question is it has a link between this public school system and the private, you know, the system. In other words, the reason why Korean kids are doing well again is not because, you know, success of public school education, but maybe success of private, you know, the tutoring industry rather than, you know, the public school system. Yes? How many percent would you say actually comprise Korean That's a very good point, actually. It depends on whether it's a primary school students, middle schools, and, you know, the high school. So what are you saying? I don't have, a, you know, the number right with me, but actually, you know, I have to generally say actually more than half of kids actually taken private tutoring to some extent because, you know, again, you know, there's a, some definition issue about what can be co count as, you know, the private tutoring, like, you know, but in general, you know, some surveys show, depending on the, you know, the level of education, but probably more than in, in, a, in each level, more than half of kids, you know, take a sort, you know, kind of, you know, the private tutoring. So that's why, you know, they make a, this kind of criticism. <coughs> but indeed, I'm not, yes? So, you know, despite this criticism, I get the impression that Americans are imitating Korean New York Times has an article some time back about non-Korean schools needed for an American student, the parents sending them to quote-unquote yeah. cram schools in the New York area, plus also scalpers, 
you know, to do it. Yeah, right, exactly. So you know, you know, actually one of the, my research besides this Korean education is indeed I have a paper to look at these Korean schools and, you know, Kaplan, like, you know, the uh, commercial prep SAT surveys by the East Asians, you know, kids. And this, that's a very interesting area to look at because uh, if you look at recently in New York Times, there's a growing, you know, expansion of this kind of surveys, you know, commercial you know, SAT prep in, in the United States, in, especially in the ethnic community. So, you know, that's a very interesting study, but here's I'm more focused on actually, you know, just Korean kids in Korea. So let me talk a little bit about this traditional Korean education, which actually you know, make this impression about standardization, rigidities, and no, you know, the freedom, like no flexibility of Korean education. So indeed, in the, you know, this is a little outdated model. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, Korean education has changed over time. So, you know, some of the criticism of Korean education is no longer true because they no longer is so highly standardized. They have a very actually, you know, the flexible in many sense, which will, I, know, I will highlight today. I mean, so in other words, some of the criticism again is pretty much based on outdated model, which is no longer actually, you know, to apply to Korean education. But in like the even only before the 2000s, Korean education has a high level of, you know, the education standardization and centralization. So it was controlled and guided by the central government, special ministry of education, the Ministry of Education actually creates this uniform curriculum, even pace of instruction. So you have to teach the same uniform, you know, the uh, curriculum across all school and across all students. And you know, obviously, nationwide college entrance exam makes this actually easier to have, you know, the same uniform curriculum and pace of instructions across school. Even within school, there's a very homogeneous schooling experience. In other words, no ability groupings. So in other words, within class, the kids are exposed to the same curriculum. Even if you are doing well as compared to your peers, you are still exposed to the same curriculum as those who are actually behind you. <coughs> within schools, no tracking system. So kids actually basically you know, take the same, you know, the, again, the same curriculum. No grade retention. In the United States, if you like, you know, behind uh, your peers at the same one grade, then sometimes you may be hold back, held back, right? So parents, teachers recommend to stay one more year to catch up. But in Korea, there's no retention system. Every kid had to move to the next uh, level, regardless of their abilities. So, this is another example of you know how this Korean education was so highly standardized and highly actually uniform, right? No great retention. So my friends, actually, I have the same, exact same, you know, you, you know, it's all, it's all <coughs> as compared to the, my friend. But actually, essence of this standardized Korean education is high school equalization policy. This high school equalization policy, actually, you know, the randomly assigned students to schools within their school district. After middle school years, the Korean education system consists of six years of primary school, three years of middle school, and three years of high school. So after middle schools, you go to vocational high school or academic high school. But when you go to academic high school, which is, you know, now the 75% of kids go to academic high school, you cannot choose school in those areas where these policies apply. So here's, you know, the students are randomly assigned to school. So you don't know until the lottery was conducted. So I went to actually in a boys' school, which I hate. And I was really hoping, hoping to get to the you know, the Korea school, <laughs> so that I can have a descend my life three years in high school. But it's because of this terrible system, I was assigned to boys' school without my, you know, the choice. But this is not only for the single sex and, you know, the Korea school, but it is even regardless of whether public or private school. In other words, in Korea, public, private school even can choose their students. They just received the students that was actually randomly assigned by a lower system. So no school choice, yes? Um, is this still true or is it universally true? No, this is not no longer true. So that's why I call it a traditional kind of model. But it is actually true until the last year in Seoul, which is a major capital, where it is you know, the largest metropolitan area. There actually the students couldn't choose any schools until last year. But this year, the new governments, again, under the, this new liberal kind of idea, they actually change the system. So now you can actually list three schools, then you will be like randomly assigned within, you know, to, among your choice. 
So it's a different system. But until 2009, in Korea, in Seoul, that was system was actually maintained. But there's uh, some other area where Busan, which is the second largest metropolitan area, there's uh, some of students can choose school. Like 30 to 40 percent of students are assigned to those schools that they prefer. But the other six percent students actually was randomly assigned like this system. So there's uh, some mixture of this 100 percent random assignment versus you know, some choice. But in Seoul, actually, yes, indeed, it, until last year, was actually pretty strictly applied to the system. So it is, this policy was implemented since 1974, when there was a big issue about the between school inequality at the high school level. So the kids wanted to go to you know the better school at the time by applying to schools and testing you know take, took a test, but then there was a big issue about between school inequality in resource and uh, you know the quality. So the Korean government indeed is one of the probably I say the one of the extreme you know experiment that ever done in probably history of education, no, probably not across all the world, I mean, I, would say, I can say. <coughs> then obviously, you know, because, uh, uh, there's some growing criticism on this high school equalization policy in general. So, you know, some people start to complain about <coughs> this standardized homogeneous educational process. There's some people raise a concern about Korean education, which is not able to produce workers with, you know, high skill in, a, in competitive global market. So you know the globalization, freedom, choice, like individualizations, those were the big words nowadays in South Korea. As you know, the kind of liberal kind of idea that you know more choice, more freedom by parents will actually boost just the academic achievement rather than this you know tight control or uniform you know the educational system. Then there's a growing demand for school choice and differential educational opportunity for students with different ability. Especially the students, uh, you know, parents of students who are actually doing out in schools, who actually, you know, to raise their concern for that, you know, <coughs> that their kids are not exposed to the, you know, the curriculum that actually meet their need. They have to suffer from this, you know, the the school, the curriculum that designed for average students rather than these top students. So there was a green concern about this issue, and also, you know, the gain in relation to the individualization, like the globalizations, choice. Again, the quality and excellence of education would, you know, becomes a major kind of, you know, the word to describe, you know, the, what we need, you know, for Korean education. So these, you know, the things, you know, the growing, you know, change over time, and there's, you know, the strong argument for this curriculum differentiation. So I mean, the curriculum differentiation means that different opportunity in terms of the curriculum that students are exposed, or in terms of type of school that students can go to, you know, after middle school. So the people who argue that we need more curriculum differentiation or more individualized educational opportunity argue that by providing different curriculum at different pace of instruction with two students with different abilities, increased curriculum differentiation should benefit both high ability and low ability students. So their arguments are, you know, is very important. They believe that having more choice to even high ability, low ability children, they think they can actually benefit both children. The low achieving kids may catch up by maybe slower, you know, pace and easier curriculums to catch up. But high ability kids may actually move forward by taking more serious, you know, curriculums, more advanced, you know, the math curriculum and science curriculum, so, so on. Then the high level of Korean education has made top talent students mediocre by not providing advanced curriculum. So, you know, again, this is kind of, you know, the major argument of those who want more uh, the curriculum differentiations. So, you know, there was someone who said that there's no Bill Gates in Korea. So, you know, that typically shows that how Korean education is now well developed to, you know, to grow this, you know, the top ability students. But indeed, Bill Gates even didn't finish his college education, right? So, <laughs> we don't know whether this is really, you know, no issue whether you know this is really issue. So this is a you know, kind of chain. So in these kind of criticisms and counter argument of this standardization indeed succeed in some sense to change this education policy. So since two thousand uh, in Korea, actually Korean education becomes more individualized, more differentiated, more kind of American style education. So if we almost still say Korean in you know, a highly standardized, highly you know the uniformized education, that's not only true. He or she just don't know much about the recent trends of Korean education. Since 2002, actually, gift education law was actually implemented. 
So now that you give talent, you know, students who are identified teachers are actually segregated into, you know, actually, you know, to meet, uh, go to the different actually co program <coughs> after regular school. So they are indeed actually exposed to a different curriculum. More, you know, importantly, actually, even within regular school, there was a growing, you know, the curriculum differentiation. So since 2000, especially ability grouping was introduced in South Korean education. So now kids depend on their ability to go to a different school, different classroom within school. So if you're doing well in math, then you will probably take like a you know, calculus. If you're not doing well, you take some, you know, some common math. So if you're not doing well, then you take actually a low level of math. In science, in English, in Korean. So indeed, actually, now if you look at the middle school and high school in Korea now, days, no longer is it true that actually Korean kids are uh, exposed to the same curriculum. They're exposed to different curriculums now, like the U.S. education. Then not even to within school, you know, the differentiation, but between school differentiation also increased by having more uh, kind of different, you know, the schools that are not subject to high school equalization policy. So the way in which the Korean government actually avoid this high school equalization policy is that because you know, high school equalization policy actually contain very kind of a core interest of Korean people, which is e equality. So the Korean government was very afraid to touch on this issue of equality. So they don't want to be seen as you know, the losing equality. So they don't touch usually this core of the Korean you know, the uh, policy, but they actually set up, they established a new school that was not supposed to be, you know, not subject to the high school collection policy. So they still keep the policy in some area, but in some area you can actually choose to school, but you, they still you know, maintain this, you know, the high school collection policy. So foreign language school, for instance, science high schools, they are not subject to this high school collection policy. They can choose their students on the base of their abilities, and also, you know, some to some extent, they're, you know, the probably a family background as well. The new independence private school. So they are, they are really now become private in school. In the past, private school also should be subject to the high school equalization policy, but these new independent private schools are really private. So they don't have to, you know, they, have, they can choose their students by themselves now, but not literally. So as you can see that, you know, in many aspects of Korean education, since 2000, this, you know, the system changed. So some of the uh, typical criticisms or some of the typical understanding of Korean education is no longer actually true in some sense. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about this within school curriculum differentiation because this is uh, one of the, you know, the, I think it's a major change that happened in Korea. <laughs> The Korean primary and secondary school, again, have a restricted topic prohibits within school curriculum differentiation, such as ability grouping in the past. But now the seventh national curriculum, you know, to, in Korea, there's a, you know, the, uh, like uh, until now, there's a, some, you know, the, like a, the change in major curriculum, and this seventh national curriculum actually committee actually de uh, developed this idea of a curriculum differentiation further, and it was actually implemented since 2000 for the first time of Korean his history of Korean education. Then the rapid increase of ability groupings. Now in 2006, 68% of middle schools have implemented this ability grouping. Again, this indication clearly shows that actually you know, no longer this standardized or no ability grouping is not actually you know, a true description of Korean education. So what am I doing here? So give these change and typical criticism on Korean education. <coughs> I'd like to see what's the reality of Korean education using some data that I have. So I'm not telling you that these critical criticisms are totally wrong, but I want to be a little closer, you know, to what really happens in Korean education by looking at some of the data, you know, and try to think about, what, you know, to what extent these typical criticisms are will really reflect the reality of Korean education. So the fourth criticism again, does Korean education make talent students mediocre? I mean, this can be done relatively simply by comparing country, right, of especially of the top students. So if we compare across country of those top students, if top students in Korea indeed do worse in academic performance than top students in the other you know, industrial country, indeed we can say to some extent that yes, 
for some reason, Korean kids, especially at the top level, do not do well as compared to the other top students in the country. Right? So we can compare, we can see whether you know, to some extent, you know, this, whether this criticism on Korean education is valid. Another way of looking at this issue is actually look, we can also look at the change over time, not only across country, because you know, education policy changed since 2000. If we compare 2000 and afterward and see how top kids are doing well <coughs> before the actual education reform and you know, after education reform, we can say something about whether this actual movement toward individualization actually was successful to increase the ability of top students. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to do two things. One, again, the cross-national comparison, see how top students in Korea compare top students in other country. Second, given there was actually in, uh, the trend toward increase, you know, the individualization and differentiation of educational opportunity, if I see the top students in after 2000 really doing well than actually top students in before the education reform, Indeed, maybe that's the reason why the Korean kids were not doing, uh, top students were not doing well before education reform, right? So I will show some of, you know, kind of data that I had, see to what extent this can be, you know, <coughs> assessed. So for this study, I used the data called the PISA. This is not a PISA, you know, the <laughs> power, but uh, this is a program for international students assessment that was conducted by OECD about 40 to 50 countries. Indeed, this is one of the largest data set, you know, obviously 40 to 50 countries, you know, the participant. And Korea participated in all PISA data, 2000, 2003, and 2006. And there's actually, you know, the new round of survey, 2009. So indeed, you know, so in principle, I would really like to see, compare 2000 and 2009 to have more time, how see this educational reform actually affected students' achievement. But unfortunately, until today, 2009 data was not available. So I'm just looking at 2000, 2003, and 2006 to see how the, what's the kind of general trend. So I don't make any, you know, the cultural claim here, but I just try to see that what's the trend in of this uh, distribution of students' achievement. For this data set, you know, 15 year old in schools participate. So in 15 year olds in Korea is actually first year high school students. Okay. Then cross national, uh, this piece of data provides a cross nationally and temporary comparable measure of educational achievement, like in math, science, and reading. So, you know, teachers distribute the questionnaire and, you know, you know basically the questions of math and science and reading in class then they fill out, you know, they actually solve the problem, then they collect, then they actually, you know, you know, grade. And we have the data for that across all 40, 50 countries. In order to make this comparison very, you know, compatible across country, see did a great job to make the question very comparable. Because especially for reading, I mean, you know, some of the questions may be very culturally based, right? I mean, for instance, in some countries, there's no, not many computers, right? So if there's some uh, question about the computers, then you know some students may be disadvantaged just because they're not familiar with the computers, rather than they really don't know about the question. So, but they did you know, a pretty good job. But still, you know, you may concern about whether this really can be compared across country. Okay. So here's the data. Here's the finding. So I tried to reduce my number and try to see you know, just some figures to you know to make more interesting. So this is the, uh, the cumulative distribution of student score. So let's start with the Japan. This, you know, the red line, okay? So I just, you know, just set up the students from the bottom to the top and see how their score. So this kid is 90 percentile in Japanese distribution, right? So 90 percentile means the top 10 percent. So their score is about 600, as well, like a 20 something, right? That's how you read the graph. Let's take a look at the half, you know, 50%, another median kids whose score is about 550. The bottom 20 kids, the score about a little less than 500 in Japanese, you know, the figure, right? That's how you read the graph. Then I have here Korea, which is a blue line. Very similar to the Japanese case, right? But not little difference here. But what you hear is the what? 
First of all, let's take a look at this top kid. Okay, top, top 10%. There's no evidence, at least given this figure, that Korean top kids are worse than actually top kids in the US or even Germany. Am I right? Right? Korean kids even show actually doing better than this US kids, top 10%. This is a science. If you look at math, it's like exactly the same pattern. At least, let's think about it is whether, let's forget about whether it is the effect of private tutoring or not, because I mean, I, that's my third chapter, which I argue that that's not the effect of private tutoring, but that's a different story. I mean, we'll not tell the, this time. I will save for another time. But, <laughs> But at least, I mean, you can see that it's not a clear that actually, you know, Korean kids are the worst, top kids are worse than, you know, the other top kids in other countries, right? But more interesting to me is actually bottom. So if you look at the difference with, uh, among those top kids are relatively smaller across the country. In other words, top kids in Korea, top kids in Finland, top kids in Japan, they're just doing well. They're simply they're doing well, regardless of which country they are located. American top kids, yes, doing a little lower, but you know, not, they're not much. But if you look at the bottom kids, that makes a really big difference. Like, you know, there's like, you know, top 20, uh, bottom 20% in Korea score like a 480, and the US, top, uh, uh, I'm sorry, like a 480, and US kids about like a 400. 80 point degree difference is a huge difference in this scale. So 500 was mean, and 100 is one standard deviation in this scale, and this is a huge difference. In other words, somehow Korean education is doing a better job to make these low achievement kids to maintain certain level of achievement literacy skill than actually US <coughs> education, right? So that was actually in a 2000 case. So at least, is when we compare cross country, we don't see any evidence that actually the top kids in Korea doing worse than actually top kids in other countries. If you look at the other outcome again, math, no, there's no evidence. I will show some of the another measure which called the problem solving skill. No, Korean kids are still doing well. There's no evidence, at least with the, uh, the com competitive uh, competitive across country. Let's take a look at how it will change over time in Korea. Again, my expectation is that because the increase in the curriculum differentiation, you expect the top students in 2006 will be doing much better than top kids in the 2000s, right? And also probably these low bo bottom students will be doing better in 2006 rather than 2000. Again, because curriculum differentiation may provide better chance even to low achieving kids, right? That's our expectation. Let's just see how it changed. So here's a 2000 mass survey because you may wonder whether I make some lie for the science or for, for the mass, but here's a mass survey. 2000, again, this is a Korean 2000. If you look at like a 90 percentile of students, like a 600 above 600 and something like that, what happened in 2003? What's the difference? <coughs> Top kids in 2003 start to actually show even a little better outcome, right? Yes? But the bottom, actually the bottom kids start to actually, you know, the doing worse than the 2000 survey. What about 2006? Very similar for the 2003, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, you don't see even difference between 2003 and 2006. So this is a math. What about the science? Science is more clear, right, the change. So 2000 blue line, 2003, you see that actually, you know, that there's a growing in achievements among top students, but again, these, you know, they're doing worse among the, those bottom students. 2006, even these top kids don't show actually, you know, the better performance, but more interesting, more importantly, I think the bottom students start to seem suffer from these, you know, achievements as compared to the bottom in 2000 years, right? So what happened here? Again, we expect, because of this growing differentiation of students, we expect that you know, both top students or bottom stu uh, and bottom students will do better in 2006 rather than 2000. That was not the case. Either there's no difference among top kids 
but consistently for this bottom key starts actually lose their ground. If there is an effect, what happens after 2000 is indeed the bottom keys, low term keys in Korea, plus actually you know they're doing worse than actually their previous you know all years cohort. Yes. I, uh, you compared the bottom three Delta Korea, so you compared 2000 with 2003. That if something happened to other countries in 2000, right, right, countries, exactly, right, right, right. No, I think exactly. So actually. Yes, I have some more pictures. But the bottom line is that if I answer to your question, yeah, it is not because the other countries change, but it is because it really changed in Korea. Yes, I checked that. So again, this is a 2000. Again, oh yeah, I, I think this is a good way to answer your question. So in 2000, you know, the mass by country, as you can see that, you know, much difference within bottom you know, students, right? In other words, the top piece Korean is doing as much as the top kids in the U.S. or even better than, but you know, especially these bottom students are really stronger than you know bottom students. In other words, in the United States, if you have a kids in the U.S., you have to really be careful if your kids are not doing well, because they are really you know they're suffering from this low achievement. If your kids who are not doing well in South Korea, you are at least safe, because I mean they are doing as much. Indeed, these bottom kids. If you actually compare this division to the other, you know, the country, their bottom 20% in Korea is actually close to the 50% in other country, many country. Indeed, they're very strong at your bottom. So what's if I mean? So what happened to here? In my sense, I mean, again, I'm not making any cultural claim, but I think in my sense, the big impact of standardized education is it indeed make these low achieving kids to achieve certain level of literacy skill, which is actually you know, the lacking in the U.S. U.S. system is not because of this localized and you know, the non standard education system. They may do better job for this, you know, teaching in you know, a higher achieving kids, but they are not doing well to teach this low achieving kids. So the, here the question is whether do we want to go direction to the U.S. by having more individualized education, or we want to keep this policy of high school equalization and standardized education to keep these bottom keys you know, to maintain certain level of literacy skill. So again, there are probably other reasons to affect this different figure, but I think you know, it's still interesting to look to think about you know, what is the consequence of this changing tour, you know, away, moving away from standardization, and how does that affect the students at the different location of distribution, instead of just simply looking at the average score. How much do I have time? I mean, do I have to stop soon? Well, you can go another five. Okay, so let me then kind of you know summarize what I found. So using PISA data, I found that growing achievement gap between students at the top and at the bottom of distribution across PISA 2000, 2003, and 2006, which likely I guess are driven by worsening achievement of students at the bottom and improving or persistent achievement at the top. So the United States, I think you know, the really real problem that Korean education is facing now, in my sense, is about this growing inequality at the student achievement. Especially in you know, these bottom students, like a losing ground, probably not only for achievement, but probably in other outcome as well. So you know, because of this, you know, the moving away from standardization and introducing more individualized opportunities, like a choice, freedom. Sometimes it does not actually produce the outcome that you would expect to, you know, affect better, to produce better outcome. So I think there is a really kind of you know, really likely a linkage between increased curriculum differentiation and growing inequality of students' achievement. I have actually a couple of other analyses that are interesting, but let me actually move for, to the second you know, the criticize that I'm interested about. I mean, I haven't developed this idea yet, yet so, but I'd like to share it so that I'd like to get some feedback from you. It's about the issue of the creativity, which is, I think, a very interesting you know, idea, whether really some country, uh, kids in some country have a greater level of creativity <laughs> than others. This is an interesting issue, but indeed it's very difficult to address because the creativity, it's very hard to measure creativity. What is the creativity at all? Probably it's a very you know, the culturally driven concept, and it's very hard to measure you know, the creativity. So indeed, you know, the little empirical research comparing the level of the creativity across different countries. 
I mean, I see that some of sociology here, but this is in the indeed issue that has not been well, I guess, addressed. I mean, what is creativity and how the countries are different in terms of their, you know, teaching creativity to students. Although lots of people you know, started, you know, for long actually talked about how it is important to teach creativity to students, right? But it hasn't been well in you know, the uh, research in my sense. So the argument is a lot learning and memorization main. My sense is a lot, okay. Let's assume that Korean, some of Korean education actually kids are more exposed to the road learning and memorization than the US kids, which is true. I'm sure that that's true. You know, I remember I memorized all like, you know, thousand Chinese characters in when I was like, you know, five, five years old. So I know that <laughs> that's true. But is it true that those remote learning and memorization is really antithetical to creativity? If you do memorize, you think actually you lose creativity? I don't know. So that's my kind of, you know, kind of intuition that may not be antithetical. In other words, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you have actually good memorization, you may be even have a greater, you know, level of creativity. But again, because I don't have data, I cannot address this interesting issue. Then I was looking for some data set, and interesting enough, the PISA 2003, they have major called problem-solving skill. So this is not based on any curriculum. This is just problem solving skill. So here's an example. So please answer the question and you see whether you can solve this problem that's given to 15 years old kids. So this is the community is organizing five day children's camp, okay? 46 children have signed up for the camp and eight adults have volunteered to attend and organize the camp. So here's the adult, here's the dormitory, okay? Number of bed. So there's a rule about dormitory. Boys and girls must sleep in separate dormitory. <coughs> At least one adult must sleep in each dormitory. The adults in a dormitory must be of the same gender as the children. <coughs> then fill the table here, I just cut a little bit, but fill the table to allocate these 46 children and eight adults to the dormitory keeping to the older rule. Can you assign? So this is a question, okay? Yes, you may still say that, well, this is not a matter of creativity. It's not, it's nothing to do with the creativity. Then I, yes, it's not probably the creativity. But it is not a curriculum-based <coughs> curric uh, question either, right? It has something that, you know, you have to apply your knowledge to solve some problems. So what if we look at this measure and say that Korean kids are at least doing as, do well as American kids then we may have little bit of understanding that maybe it's not quite true that Korean kids, you know, like, you know, relatively lack, you know, they have less, you know, the low degree of creativity. Are you with you? But I don't know. I'm just thinking that, you know, we'll try to find some data set that may tell something about this, let, you know, kind of ability of to problem solving skill if it's not like the creative per se. Again, yes, this is a pencil based test, so probably it doesn't tell us again about the creative per se. But you know, better than nothing, mm. right? Again, this is not like you know the curriculum-based test. So what if? Okay, this is every school. Again, Korean kids are at the top every school, 550. Okay, let's take a U.S. I always like to see U.S. Okay, <laughs> where's the U.S.? Okay, I think this yes, 477. See, among those countries, are pretty bad. Right, pretty bad. So average score 550. Again, 100 uh, is actually one standard deviation. See, you know, even actually like 100, almost 100 different in every score, which is a huge difference. I mean, then someone say, well, again, it may be not be every score. Again, creativity does matter for a lot of different kids, right? Is it only proper for Bill Gates, whether we can have Bill Gates or not? <laughs> so take a look at this, you know, the, then the top kids. Again, the same graph, Korean kids located here, right? I'm sorry, Korean is black. Yes, they are doing better than actually the US and German kids. So let me back up to this question. So again, I'm not saying that I answered the question about the creat this creativity using this measure. But what I try to do is actually, you know, yes, there's some very typical criticism on Korean education. But sometimes we just take it granted that those are criticisms are you know very you know the valid. But if you look at carefully uh, some you know data available, then I have to say that some of the criticisms are not quite valid. 
it only reflects this old model or it doesn't you know, really you know, tell, it's not consistent with the, what the data actually tells. So that's what you know, the, my book, which hopefully again will come in on January <laughs> or February, <laughs> that, you know, that I try to address these three different criticisms and also two other you know, kind of typical criticisms so that, you know, that I like to be a little close, so one step close to the reality of Korean education. Thank you. If you, are, if you have any questions, uh, please address them to the protocol. Yes. Uh, Can you explain a little detail about the uh, concerned data itself? You know, I mean, depend, we know that depending on the region, yeah. even there can be a big difference between private school and public school. So uh, I think um, I'm just wondering about the data themselves. No, I think that's a very good point. I mean, at least this is a national, random, uh, national representative.